right. So we have our very first queen shit from our Patreon Woo. subscriber, uh, Hanope. And she wants to share with us a success story. One year ago, I was in the middle of divorcing a low-value male. He was abusive and manipulative. He cheated. And when I spoke up about it, he tried to manipulate my family against me and convince them that I'm imagining things and that I needed mental help. That was it for me. I asked for a divorce shortly after. During the divorce, the emotional abuse got worse. He actually ended up sending me a list of everything that is wrong with me, how he thinks I'm a failure, and that I won't be going anywhere in life. This 34 years old unemployed prick with no degree or career prospects actually sat down in his parents' house and typed out a list of reasons why I'm a failure. <laughs> Meanwhile, right. <laughs> I, I mean, I don't know. I don't know if it's just me, but it's always the unemployed guys who have absolutely no prospects that tend to be the most abusive and just try and just just try the hardest to bring you down. Because he knows that she's better than him. And so he's sending her yeah. a list of everything that's quote unquote wrong with her because he wants her to feel as bad. He wants her to feel bad about herself as shit as him. so that he can control her more easily. It's like abuse 101. Yeah, yeah. it's fucked up. Yeah, I, b- I believe we even had a, a thread on that about uh, how sometimes the guys at the bottom of the social hierarchy feel more desperate to dominate women because they have no other power in their life. So yeah. it's just all yeah. desperation. Um, so to continue, uh, she says, meanwhile, I landed a high paying job and was already planning to move to another continent. Exactly one Ooh. month after the, after the divorce, I moved as planned. A year later today, I'm in my late 20s, living my best life. I got my dream job, an amazing apartment. I can afford nice things in life. And I met amazing people and traveled quite a bit. I've never been happier. Yes, queen. Yes. Yay. Yes. We love to see it. <laughs> yes, queen. Yes. We celebrate your level up. And she says, thank you, ladies, for everything you do. FDS helped me process my trauma and played a huge part in me becoming the confident woman I am today. So thank you so much for that feedback. Awesome. That makes me happy. I'm smiling so much. That's just, that's made my week. Warms my terrible cold heart. That's yeah. like, <laughs> for, for all the shit we put up as moderators, it's those kinds of stories that make me that go like, oh my gosh, it. that makes it worth it. <laughs> that just makes it worth it. It's amazing. 100%. 100%. So congrats to you. Congrats to you. Kudos to you. So that was our queen shit. If you'd like to submit your own uh, story of your own level up, please visit our Patreon at patreon.com forward slash the female dating strategy. And you can sign up for one of our tiers and submit your story. And we will uh, select one every one or two every week as part of a raffle and we'll read it on air. Thank you. And check us out. What's up, queen? Welcome to the Female Dating Strategy Podcast. I'm your host, Ro. And this is Lilith. And we have two very special guests today who are going to talk to us about what it's like to date with autism and how FDS has helped them manage the dating world and mismatched expectations between men and women. So we have our first guest, uh, who is Artemis. Hi. Hi, Artemis. And our second guest, Dana. Hi there. So just to kind of kick things off, I, you know, can you just tell us a little bit about yourself? Um, Okay, I'll start. So I was diagnosed with autism at 29. And that started a self discovery process that really helped me a lot, really understanding all my problems. And then last year, I was browsing Reddit. And one of the posts from FDS made the front line um, from Reddit. Um, It was being dissed I think people were like making fun of it or something so I was like oh what is this and then I was blown out because it was amazing and it really 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 helped me hi there I'm Artemis um I found FTS through a couple of my friends that uh, we were you know looking for a centered women-centered empowered um online space um you know we in, in our friendships, we help each other grow and encourage each other to be the best version of ourselves. And, you know, we found that FGS does that and, you know, encourages us to love ourselves and love other women. And, you know, I, I really was drawn to it um, initially by that and, um, and found that, you know, in being autistic, it, it helped me navigate dating and navigate the world a little better and navigate some, some relationships. Um, it's really been helpful. I was surprised to learn that, you know, autistic women have, you know, unique struggles related to 
to dating. So, you know, since I'm, I started out doing this, like modding stuff, being a little bit ignorant about autism, can we maybe start out by going over what autism is and what are some of the misconceptions about autism that most people have? I'll say this. Um, I didn't realize when we started writing about like having clear boundaries that it would it would be of such value of with autistic women and I remember that we got a post and I believe it's in the handbook where uh, an autistic person was discussing the fact that without uh, clear guidelines and boundaries sometimes it's very very easy to manipulate autistic people because they have difficulty picking up on social clues is that true to your experience or let me let me just start by saying like what autism is so it you can kind of get an overall um so autism is, is in a disease it's not like there's anything wrong with us there's a lot of misconceptions about what it is and 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 um it's like a mac versus a pc it's just a different operating system for the brain macs are better at some things and worse at others and the world is set up for a pc right the world has PCs everywhere, and occasionally you'll find a Mac. Um, so uh, one in 68 people are diagnosed with autism, and it's basically when you're developing um, in childhood, there's something in the brain called synaptic pruning, and that's when like a neuron will go to another neuron, right? It's, it's like a one pathway, and when you as a neurotypical person hear a reference to something, you connect that one thing to the one thing. Well, with autism, we don't prune all of those synaptic connections. So it's like a tree and it can go many different ways. So sometimes we need a clear path to the way that the neurotypical person is seeing the thing that we are seeing. Um, so like, for instance, um, it's like, you know, Netflix and chill. Like now everybody knows that Netflix and chill needs hook up. But autistic people, like when you'd ask us to come over and watch a movie, like we literally thought we were coming over to watch a movie. So we're a little more naive. Sis, I got to tell you, we all did. Well. We all did at first. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, I mean, that's, like, that's a more extreme example, you know. No, but, like, yeah. we, don't, we don't get those social cues, so we're much more easily taken advantage of. We can't, like, protect ourselves. So it's like, okay, so now that memes came out telling us what Netflix and chill is, we know what it is and we can build our, you know, social interactions around that. Like we can say, hey, like, I don't know if I want to Netflix and chill with you, but, you know, we can do this instead, you know. So uh, there's, it, I think FGS really helps um, get, like, get a, a set of guidelines that we can follow um, to make sure that we're not being take adva taken advantage of. Um, so does it kind of help lubricate certain types of social interactions or more bring more clarity? It absolutely can. Yeah. I mean, I think some of the things are with autism, like we have a lot of experiences and we within human experience, um, we kind of build little boxes that people put things in, right? And an autistic person just organizes those boxes differently. So we need to have a more direct, uh, like direct communication, direct, um, you know, a lot of people think that, we, that we're really blunt and we're really rude. And when we're just trying to communicate, we're not as soft with our language sometimes. So we can come off offensively when we don't mean to. Um, it's it's definitely the the biggest issue sometimes with us is communicating with neurotypical people on both ends because we don't know what they're saying and then they sometimes will form a context around what we're saying when we're really just meaning what we're saying literally. Um, so um, the uh, one thing I also wanted to mention, like you know, there's different. A lot of people say there's like high functioning autism and low functioning autism. But that's not really how the spectrum works. It's um, it's it's like when you have a sound bar and there are different. There's a bass and there's treble and there's all of these different things. And it's not that that things get higher or lower um, 
it, things can get higher or lower than average, right? Like, so some people think autistic people don't have empathy, but really autistic people have a lot of empathy sometimes or no empathy sometimes. Um, it's not, you know, some people are nonverbal. Some people like me are very verbal. We don't shut up. <laughs> so it, it, a lot of people have this like concept of what they think autism is, but that's really, it's really based around boys. It's based around boy children that um, present in a certain way, and that's often not not what it actually is. So yeah, could you tell me more about how autistic men and autistic women present differently? And then maybe further, why do you think so much emphasis has been put on boys rather than how it affects girls? Yeah, um, the differences actually in the post by an autistic woman that is on the FDS um, handbook she mentions that the typical interests of autistic boys tend to be like transport, like trains. That's a very typical one. They're obsessed with trains and with organizing them. Or other non-social interests in boys, like mathematics, for example. So trains and mathematics, they are two very clear ones. And then women like things that are considered stereotypically feminine like they they might like dolls or animals or they might love celebrities so people don't really pick up that this girl is actually not developing the same way as the other girls are because her interests are so typically feminine that everybody just assumes ah, she's just a normal girl and nobody really picks up on the other cues on the other stuff that's going on is it something that presents in extremes? Because I would think for little boys too, it wouldn't be, it wouldn't necessarily be atypical for them to be interested in math or trains. Is it just like a, is it, it that they're inter interested in these things to the exclusion of other things? Yeah, exactly. You make a very good point and a very good question. So the reason people really pick up on it on, on with boys is that they see that they reject social interaction in favor of the trains, the math, or whatever it is their, their special interest is. So that would be the thing that really makes people notice. The boy refusing social contact um, to be with their special interest. So with girls, because so much of our social conditioning is around being social, I would almost think it would show up quicker for girls, but I guess not because people think it like playing with dolls or being obsessed with celebrities because those are people or representations of people that must mean that they are good at social interaction or they're learning proper social interaction. Yeah. And also if a girl is quiet by herself in a corner playing with her dolls for some reason that doesn't raise alarms in people, especially not just parents, but also like teachers or other education professionals that see that. Oh, the girl is just being a girl, being in a corner, quiet, playing with dolls. But also women are a lot better at masking and they don't stim as much. So men, so stimming is a really big part of autism. When uh, somebody shakes their leg or when they're flapping their hands around or doing things like that, it's a, a big way that an autistic person can calm down. And the reason we need to calm down often is that because we don't have that synaptic pruning, the sensory stimuli is very overwhelming for us. So women do stimming in other ways that are is not outwardly presenting like males or um, male children are, are do. So like you'll see um a kid sometimes even screaming and you know that is a really big off-putting thing to some people and um they'll try to get their kid diagnosed but um the other thing you know there's something called masking so women are much better at masking and basically what that means is we copy people's behavior sometimes we don't know why you do something we just do it to fit in and because we saw you do it so that's we learn women are so much better at learning social signals and copying them to look like a typical person when we're maybe not yeah and that's actually one of the main reasons why autistic women burn out because they have to mask all the time and that means like playing a role like you're in a in a theatrical play and whenever you step out of home 
you step into this character who looks into other people's eyes, who talks like other people talk, but that's, that doesn't come natural to us, or at least to most of us, or many of us. And so we have to act. So whenever I am going to do or say something, a part of my mind has already pre-rehearsed it before. So it, it, it isn't quick, it isn't natural, it, it doesn't flow. That is the masking and it becomes really exhausting, but it's a trap because women become so good at it that people just don't believe it. Like, what? You don't look autistic. It's like, duh, because I mask <laughs> and it becomes exhausting. Yeah. And is this also why autistic women tend to be um, diagnosed much later? Like a lot of women just seem to go much of their lives not even knowing that they have autism. Oh, yeah. yeah. I mean, it's it's really it's hard to get diagnosed because it's it's very expensive. A lot of doctors don't know how to properly diagnose a woman. If insurance will pay for it, you're incredibly lucky. Uh, I was 35 when I got diagnosed. It, you know, I'm, it was this year. It's, it was a really wow. hard journey for me. So did it just like make everything in your life click into place? Was it, was it a relief when you found out or was it like, oh no, this is something, I, I guess if you've been dealing with it your whole life, you would kind of have already put together some coping mechanisms. Did, is this like a process of you unlearning things or are you learning new things or how does this work if you, if you get diagnosed at this point in your life? Well, for me, you know, I, you know, it's, it's really silly because I saw a bunch of memes from like an autistic page that one of my friends would share and they would all really click for me. And I never understood why I had so much trouble with certain things. And then, so I started looking into it and I, it just fit me exactly to a T. And then, you know, I, I thought like maybe I was a little bit, you know, a little bit, you know, on, on a little bit of the spectrum. And then it just, one day it just all clicked and I, I went to get evaluated and I, you know, I talked with more people. I, I have actually, I actually have a disease called Ehlers-Danlos and, and dysautonomia. And a lot of people with the disease have um, autistic characteristics and have autism spectrum disorder as well. So um, it was something that once I saw that research, you know, I, I, thought I should get evaluated. And, and now the research says a lot of people have both. So once you have that information, what do you, what do you do with it? Like, do you change anything in your life? Or are you just sort of, it's just sort of comforting to kind of understand yourself a little bit better. I imagine there's a lot more writing and resources now for you to kind of understand how your own mind works, but is there anything that you're practicing now that you didn't before now that you learned your diagnosis? For me, definitely. For me, the main thing, um, so I've been diagnosed for about three years, a bit more. And the main thing that changed for me was giving myself permission to do the things that I need to do to dress the way I need to dress. So for example, I've given myself permission to just wear tracksuits. Whenever I need to go to work, I just get a nicer tracksuit that looks a bit more um, special, whatever, but I wear tracksuits because I cannot stand the physical sensations of tight clothing and the, your typical feminine clothing, which is also why a lot of autistic girls tend to be tomboys because the sensory discomfort from clothes, um, girly clothing is usually more uncomfortable. So that's one of the things. And also just giving myself permission to rest when I need to rest, give myself permission to not go outside if I really feel that it's not a good idea to say no to a lot of things. And this ties to, for me, a big thing after my diagnosis, which is grieving what I thought my life would be like. When I was a kid, I thought that I would be an adult who would have a lot of friends, who would go out a lot, who would have a busy job and who would do lots of things. Right now, I realize I do not have the energy for that. I get burned out really quickly. I cannot connect to people. It's, it's just not doable. So I've said goodbye to that ideal life I thought I was going to have. So that's been a big thing for me. So grieving a lot as well. And that's why I, I don't really consider autism for me to be just a different thing I for me it really is a social disability because I really feel disabled socially 
because I don't have the same energy. I don't have the same ability to just feel good with other people. Mm-hmm. So those are the, uh, those are the things for me after my diagnosis. When you when you've had positive or connective interactions with people, what has it typically been like? Is it usually when you're engaged in doing something? Is it like a particular topic that you feel more connected with people? Is there any anything that you recall in your life where you're like, I actually feel like I'm having a good social interaction or a good connection? And what was that like for you? For me, it's like right now, because right now the interactions that we're having are framed within a specific goal, a specific uh, situation with specific requirements. I know what's expected of me. I know how the situation is going to go. So things like right now or when I'm at work, when I know what I have to do, what I can expect from other people. So really structured interactions work very well for me. That makes sense as to why FDS would appeal to autistic people because we do kind of structure social interactions in a way that's not typically done with dating. I think sometimes when you look at popular culture, they have this anything goes mentality and, uh, you know, it's all about communication, but for people for whom that's very, very difficult, and even for people who don't have autism, (laughs) these interactions are just fraught with a lot of miscommunication that leaves a person open for exploitation, misunderstandings, negative social interaction, because a lot of times people don't know what's expected of them, right? Obviously, we're firm believers of FTS, but I feel I wanted to make that point because I feel like some of our critics who attack us for having gender roles don't understand that the structure actually does benefit a lot of people if we set expectations up front for ourselves and for the people that we interact with and then start to normalize certain interactions and communicate those interactions um, to make our to make our social interactions as smooth as possible and create I think a safe space for us to have a good dating experience people get mad at us for how quote-unquote structured we are right like um modern dating culture is so even for people that aren't autistic i struggle with it so like wishy-washy like oh just one day at a time just go with the flow you know oh i don't want to put a label on our relationship that kind of stuff right Um, yeah i can't do that (laughs) so i need to i need to have them in a box i neither either need to have them in the friend box or in the maybe we'll be more than friends box or that we are more than friends box because otherwise i don't know how i don't know whether i need to flirt with them i don't know i don't know how to interact with them at all if i don't know what we are and if they want to just be friends then they get mad at me when i'm not flirting and i'm like well you wanted to just be friends but they don't really mean that (laughs) And they'll get upset about the idea of the friend zone, right? Like they'll get mad at women for like, oh, they put, they, they don't consider me dating material. They put me in the friend zone or, you know, they, they've put me in this box, but like, sometimes that's necessary to make sense of the world that we live in. Not everything can just be this postmodern wishy-washy words don't have any definitions kind of nonsense. Yeah, but men put themselves in the friend zone. I mean, they they if they're if they're not taking us out on dates and if they're not acting like they True. want us, then why would we be anything more than friends with them? Facts. Because because they're Facts. they're used to women you know, to use an often used phrase in our subreddit, they're used to women being like emotional sponges and mommy McBang mates. So they kind of think that a friend means that you do all of the performative feminine labor that a woman would normally give a boyfriend and so they've you know with those lines being blurred men have started to expect more and more from women while giving less and less commitment or uh they're more non-committal in the way they interact with women but still expect and have learned have become accustomed to women still giving them all the perks of being in a relationship without actually being in a relationship i think another thing that fds does is you know fds is full of really empowered smart, beautiful women and, um, you know, encouraging us to be better at the things we want to be better at and supporting us through that is, is really huge. Um, a lot of women are intimidating on FDS to men. 
Um, you know, a, a lot of autistic women were very smart. We, we can talk about anything. We're information sponges. We can speak to any topic. And when a man brings up a topic that they think we're going to be dumb and not know how to have an hour long discussion on, and then they just get intimidated when we know more than they do. I absolutely love that so much. I'm just imagining you have a conversation with a guy who's mansplaining something you're literally an expert in and you just tear him to shreds. I don't know why, but that's a mental image that really excites me. It's really fun. I'm a molecular biologist. And when guys try to bring up things about COVID or science, and then they they try to tell me something that's so way off, not even close to being true. And then I explain everything around it. I mean, that's a really simple example, but it's just men want, oftentimes they think they know everything about everything. And then when a woman can actually speak intelligently to something, they just crawl in a little hole. And instead of being attracted to that, actually my current partner is very attracted to that and loves it. And that's why we get along so well. Oh, that's so awesome. Yeah. With men like that, it's because they always feel like they have to be better than the woman to like maintain the upper hand rather than interact with women. If you have any friends in any capacity, just platonically, you should at least have some friends that just know more about anything than you do, right? (laughs) Because they always say like you're a reflection of the five people you hang around the most. So I would love to hang around people that know things that I don't so that, you know, they could rub off on me. And I would think a person who is interested in interacting with a person rather than dominating a person would appreciate when that happens. But that's why we weed those guys out because, you know, yeah, that's frustrating. Yeah. And the hardest thing I think with dating is like sometimes you're having two different conversation with somebody like, did you guys see that Key and Peele sketch where um, they're texting each other and they're having completely different conversations? Like one of them says, you want to go like you want to go to the bar and the other one's like, you want to go like he thinks you're reading it like you want to fight. And, you know, since we don't have the same body language and tone in our voice as a normal person, or in the, I'm sorry, I don't even want to use the word normal, as a non-autistic person does, um, sometimes we're read differently than we intend. Um, so it's communication is, is really difficult. So tell me, do you have any stories like that about, you know, cases where, you know, you're in a relationship and you were saying one thing, the other person was saying one thing, and you just were not not getting each other or just speaking at each other and not, not understanding one another? Countless. I mean, so many, I mean, it's usually the opposite in that I'm very direct and they don't believe what I'm saying is the truth because they're looking for some hidden context that isn't there. They're looking for, you know, like if, if I ask, you know, if somebody asks, what's your favorite thing? I'm like, well, what is he asking for? Is he trying to take me to dinner? Is he trying to, like, why is he asking this? So I have to know how to answer it. And a, a non-autistic person will know what these questions mean when a person asks them. And when I ask a question, I'm literally asking what I'm asking. And I, I don't want you to dance around the point. I don't want anything more. I'm trying to figure out that very specific information so that I can frame whatever I need to frame around it. See, I'm the same way, but I'm not, I obviously I'm, is neurotypical an appropriate word to use? Yes. Okay. So I'm, I'm the same way, but even as a more neurotypical person, but I have found the way that my mind works. I'm a person that just likes to organize information <laughs> uh, a certain way. So I've, I've had to really work on my tone of voice because I've been tone policed as, before as well. And it's really, really frustrating. I think to a person who's like that, who is already neurotypical but I can't imagine like to the nth degree when you're dealing with legitimate social uh cognitive differences between a person who is used to women emoting and used to women like having I don't know I don't even want to say women always having hidden agendas or anything but just like used to women like giving them more emotional um uh, reaction behind their words how incredibly frustrating that can be so I, I'm just saying that to say I sympathize because I, you know, I, I just, just, you know, in my normal interactions and the way that I've interacted with men that they'll, they'll say, they'll say things like, oh, you're intimidating or you're to the point, or uh, they'll, they'll try to dress it up and be like, oh, you're masculine if you don't naturally emote. Um, and to the point where I actually started to kind of train myself to have a little bit more of a of, uh, feminine sounding sing songy voice when I, when I wanted to, but it's like, you know, it's something I, I worked on just to make my social interactions better, but I can't, you know, if, if it's something that's just not in your repertoire, you know, I, I can imagine that would lead to a lot of uh, difficult social interactions with men who are used to women doing that. 
what you said just now kind of reminded me of this, like, you know, the whole red pill thing where um, it's, they say, like, overcoming last minute resistance where, oh, you know, even if she wants to have sex with you, she'll pretend like she doesn't because she doesn't want to seem like she's a slut. And so if you're with her and you're kissing or whatever and she's pushing you away, she doesn't actually mean it. She, deep down, she actually wants it, but she's just pretending like she doesn't so that you don't think badly of her or whatever, right? And so when you come, and, and this is this sort of mentality, and it's not just a red pill thing, it's surprisingly a lot of guys seem to have that mentality of like, oh, she really wants it. She secretly wants it. They just, they feel entitled to women's emotional engagement. I think that's what it is. So then when you don't give it to them, they feel like you robbed them of something. <laughs> or they just feel like we're not into them. Like I could tell a guy a million times I'm into him. I can text him all day. But if I'm not doing very specific things that all of the other women that have done, you know, to, to show their interest, then apparently I'm not interested enough. And then they reject me before I can reject them. And then I tell them, no, look, I'm really into you. And they're like, Oh, I'm so sorry. I really didn't think you were. I'm like, but I've told you and I've showed you and I I don't know what else I can do. I'm just not doing it in the way that you're used to. Yeah, I was thinking the, what I was um, thinking of is more cases where the woman isn't into him and the guy like that. That's the weird thing about men that I even I don't understand. It's like when you act like you're into them, they think you're not into them. And then when you act like you're not into them, they think that you're into them. It's very confusing. Yeah, and it's like a guy <laughs> has to show you. A guy can tell me all day, you know, that they're into me, but if their actions don't match their words, it just doesn't fit right in that box for me. Like, it has to be, you know, a full, you know, it has to be very direct and very clear um, without being too wishy-washy, and that's really FGS approved, right? Because if if they feel lukewarm or wishy-washy, like, why would we, why would we waste our time if, like, you're with a guy for a year and he still doesn't know what he wants? And it's like, well, you know me. You know who I am. You know, you know, you, you, maybe you're not ready for some reason, but then I need to move on if, if that's, you know, if that's the case. Personally, I think men confuse themselves because they project how they feel onto us. And I think a lot of the times it's just... It's just projection and I, <laughs> there's nothing else we do at FDS is to kind of say just really, really depersonalize the way that men interact because they do so much projecting of their own emotions onto women, especially if they're interested, right? Like, I mean, that's, that's how they get the audacity. They have to, in the back of their mind, believe, oh, all these women out here secretly want me. I just have to go up over there and show them the man that I am and they're going to run into my arms, you know, stuff like that. But, you know, I mean, t women with autism tend to become fixated on helping their partner versus attending to their own needs. And we end up with the opposite types of men that are needy and that take advantage of our giving and caring culture. So FDS teaches us, like, what pikmishas are and to be able to stand up for our needs and to know what our, you know, help evaluate what our needs are. That's that's so important is being able to know what your needs are. So I I having a space like this, I think, to have women just articulate just how are they feel, even if it's like negative or positive and isn't like the best, most, you know, thought out idea, but just really truly emote so that you can identify what your needs are at a most primal level. I feel like that's got to be really valuable. Eventually going out into the world when you interact with men, if you already have a place where you can just have that free feeling, you can then build the tools to negotiate that with a man that you're dating rather than just like always starting from a place of compromise because you you start performing femininity rather than uh, performing and emoting in a way that's true and genuine to your needs. Yeah, FDS really, really helped me with that, with giving myself permission to learn and identify the needs that I hadn't really identified before, the needs that I just didn't even look at because I was too busy performing something for the enjoyment of some low-value men. And also another thing that FDS really gave me, that's something that I'm very grateful for, is a narrative where men aren't automatically good because in in life the the conversations the media that i consumed and the conversations i encountered people 
are always assuming the best of every single man. He may break all of your plans. He may destroy everything you love. He may kill your pet or sleep in a nest, whatever. But he's just a great guy. <laughs> he's just confused. <laughs> just a little confusion. You, so you saw that post with the guy who literally slept in a nest in his bedroom? I couldn't, yeah. like... Yes. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So in my life... This was like a breakthrough, like like a Buddhist enlightenment moment for me. Like, wow. <laughs> yeah, it. I'm saying it like that, but it really meant something as big as that for me. Because then I could start doubting men. Because this is the thing with many autistic people. We love rules because rules make sense out of the chaos that is life. So people tell me men are good. And I will believe that even against my own better judgment, even against my own eyes, seeing what the man is doing. So I would, I was so good at mental gymnastics to excuse everything men did to me. And FDS comes into my life and they're like, no, no excuses. If he wanted to, he would. And all of these ladies and all of these examples. So I was like, okay, men aren't really that good. I think I'm being lied to. So I could really stop men taking advantage of me. And that has given me so much life force, so much healing, so much. It sounds so kind of new agey and silly to say these words, but really it, it was um, undoing a lot of damage. It's validating. Yeah. Yeah. It's validating. Yeah. And, it, and it makes you trust your own judgment a little bit more. Exactly. Right. Especially since I think you're used to questioning your own judgment all the time because of, uh, having autism so yeah and and it's and it's so funny when I hear you guys say these things because I, I felt this way too and I know a lot of other women who are more neurotypical have felt this way but I guess it's just a matter of the degrees of it and it's not true that there's entirely no rules because as we've discussed before like we've crossed them and we've gotten really dragged by the media <laughs> for for saying things like you know, even silly things like, oh, well, we don't want to date guys with a small penis like our last episode was about. <laughs> but like, oh, yeah. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, it does feel very oppressive and like just confusing to say there's no rules, but then you keep hitting hitting up against these hidden rules. And that's something I think is happening to women all the time, regardless of their of their uh, cognitive ability. But, you know, it's like autistic people are, are seen by Autism Speaks as this plague on society that will be single forever. Like something like 98% of autistic people never find a partner. So we're told to settle for less. And FDS teaches us that we deserve more than that. We deserve what we want in a relationship and a partner that respects us and loves us. And we deserve love just like everybody else does. We are not some plague that needs to be wiped from society. So one, one of the things I've noticed in the difference between the way it seems to present to me from women to men is that for women, this, the, they know they need to have the social interactions and they think, they think about uh, the face-to-face -face interpersonal part. But what I've noticed, I guess, from the insults on, on, on Reddit, it seems to be more like they want to impress women. So they try to, they don't try to interact as much as they try to like almost show their competence, if that makes sense. And then sometimes that comes across awkward to people. Is that, am I going anywhere with that? I think a lot of men that are autistic, like try to look for ways to connect and things to do. And they fall in with the pickup artists that are telling them what to do. And those are not the people that they should be listening to. And they don't know that. They think that these people, they're getting brainwashed into thinking that these are the social skills to copy and then they do those things and then they come across as awful men when really they're these this is them trying this is them trying to 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 follow the social behaviors that they that they're being taught are right and they just don't know and that that doesn't make it any less harmful to women but i i have you know I, I think sometimes those are the men that we need to have the conversations with to say like look i i know this is hard for you and you're struggling but you can't listen to them like this is not what women want and you know i i i think it's it's important to know that like that does it like intent and 
the outcome, it, it doesn't matter. Sometimes if, if you're going to harm somebody, the outcome matters more than the intent. But I do think that a lot of times the intent to do good and to connect is there. Yeah. Okay. So that, that makes sense to me. And, and that actually kind of tracks with how the red pill came out of the gamer culture as well, is that it was a lot of men who retreated into gaming because they just were not good at social interactions offline and really got on these message boards. And then over time, they realized like, oh, I was using like the seduction mystery pickup artist stuff and it didn't work. So then Red Pill comes with this rubric of uh, rules and ideas that they can follow to get women. And there's not really like an alternative out there for men. There's no structure. And in the absence of structure, they created this incredibly toxic community, which is now wreaking havoc on any yeah. on everybody and making everybody miserable. And that's the thing. When when all of these men got together, what they created was like the most toxic um, iteration of patriarchy that you can imagine. I think this just shows the importance of having some kind of guide to social interactions. <laughs> it doesn't have to yes. be like strict gender roles, but like without them, then there's so much like bitterness and unmet expectations on both sides, right? And I think that the virtue signaling when it's not accurate both betrays us as women but also gives men the wrong idea about how to interact with us rather than us being honest if anything fds is very honest and though we get lambasted for it i feel like i would rather them think we're mean but have a more accurate understanding of how women experience the world because i think the guys, the, the men who have good intentions and actually want to improve their relationships, we have gotten so much feedback from them and being like, I finally understand some of the points that my, you know, ex-girlfriend, or ex-wife or my current wife is making that they may not have understood before because they didn't have the context or she was hinting at it or they just couldn't see the bird's eye view of how women experience the world. So you know, I'm just saying that like, you know, regardless of, you know, there's, there's good people and there's bad people. And I don't, I don't think an autistic person is any different, but uh, I do think it's important uh, to then have a series of social expectations so that you can uh, smooth out your social interactions, not create um, a bunch of um, bitterness over unmet, unmet expectations of both sides um, weed out the people that are bad, right? Because there are going to be people that are bad. Um, and also just not waste your time. I think the biggest expectation that we have is direct communication. So when you were talking about like hints and people giving hints, I think it's really hard for an autistic person to be like, oh, that means that they want me to do this. Um, and it's it's a, the biggest accommodation, I guess, that people can give us is really as direct communication as possible. And when we communicate directly to believe what we are saying. Definitely. Yeah, no, that, that's <laughs> I'm all for direct communication. I'm 100 percent in agreement with that. Um, but the reason why I wanted to make this episode in the first place was to sort of explore the sort of interaction between you know, how patriarchy and the rules that patriarchy sets out for men versus for women and how that interacts with autism. Because what Stenna said earlier about how people can, you know, autistic people can pick up on the general rules. And then when those rules aren't met, it creates resentment. It's important to remember that the rules for men and the rules for women under patriarchy are completely different. And that's why I think it, it's not how do I say this? It's not that like autism creates a certain type of man or autism creates a certain type of woman. It's that people with this condition existing in a patriarchal world are going to experience it differently simply by being male versus female, right? The thing that horrified me was I read uh, statistics about autistic women being more likely to experience sexual abuse or to have unwanted sexual encounters. And that's why I think FDS is so, so important is to help women especially it, all women, including autistic women, is to cut through these bullshit cultural narratives that, you know, tell women, you know, not to have standards or that tell women that you have to lower your standards to put and put up with a low value man if you want, you know, love or, or even just the general idea that men are good and trustworthy because they're generally not. Yeah, it's, it's a reframing of society. I mean, FDS is flat out like a reframing of a lot of these issues surrounding us by 
looking at it through the lens of what is our actual risk? What is our reward? You know, how can we uh, maximize the things that are highly rewarding and minimize the things that are highly risky, but low rewarding and uh, create a strategy from there. So it's not necessarily like the typical like feminism is just about equality or feminism is just about like being the exact same as men. It's more or less like, how do we balance our specific needs as women against the wants, I guess, of men, which is mostly wants, right? I feel like when it comes to men, like everything they need is pretty much there and they have things that they want from us. Whereas I feel like with women, we're constantly negotiating the things that we need and the downfall of modern feminism has been negotiating the away the things that we need so that we can give this illusion of sameness with men when we're not. Yeah, exactly. And it's okay to not be that way. Yeah. And and what one thing that FDS has created for me is a framework that pretty much um, encompasses the entire world for me. So I feel like I have transitioned from a world where men's desires and needs were the priority in my life. So for example, going back for a second to, to the, the rules and the way that autistic people or myself specifically um, take rules very literally. Like I expected men to be wonderful to me as long as I was pretty. You know, if if you're pretty, men will be good to you and you will transform a terrible man into Prince Charming. So I believe that. And over and over again, it wouldn't happen. Did you listen to that Princess and the Bum episode? Because yeah. <laughs> it's not you. That's the cultural messaging we get. And yeah. it's trash. It's bad. And it's exactly. not true. Sorry to interrupt. Exactly. Yes. No, that's good. That's good. So what FDS has done is um, moved me really, really. It's FDS was like like a hand from the sky who just like jerked me out of this world made for men in which I am a commodity for men, in which I am a project of a mommy McBank maid. And it has put me into a world where I am the center, where finally I am the center of my own world and a world where my benefit is what's important because my benefit does not mean someone else being deprived of the rights while the other way around is actually what happened to me, that my rights got stepped on just to satisfy some men. So what FDS really did give me was this new framework where my safety, my desires, my needs, they are okay to be centered and give, given me tools and strategies to really go about that. And, and that, that has transformed my life, probably the same or even more as my autistic diagnosis, which is something I'm really thankful for. And, you know, that's, you, you, ex, you describe the autistic experience so well. Um, you know, our needs are not valid. We are told to stop stimming because it makes other people uncomfortable. ABA is the number one most common treatment for autism. And most autistic people are against it because it basically tells us to sit down, shut up, act like we're supposed to act and don't make anybody else uncomfortable. And for us to be comfortable in this world, there are certain things that we have to do that may make other people uncomfortable because they're not what the average person does all the time. Can you explain what the ABA is? I'm, I'm sorry, that was an acronym I've never heard. I, let me look at it. Hold on, just give me two seconds. Um, well, she looks for the exact meaning. I can tell you a real quick uh, explanation. Basically, uh, Imagine an autistic little girl, she wants to stim, which means she wants to move her hands in a specific way, flapping or whatever. She wants to move around and an adult is next to her, forcing her and telling her, no, look at this picture. What is in this picture? There is a duck. Say duck. Duck. How do we spell duck? No, say duck. No, don't look at that. Look at the picture. What is this? This is a duck. Say it out loud. Say duck. And you see the little girl just shrinking and shrinking and shrinking until her own soul is kind of broken and she just does what she's told that's basically this quote-unquote therapy that is horrifying to me and that sounds like basically conditioning women to be compliant and that is terrifying to me yeah it sounds for applied behavior analysis and the goal it says on autism speaks it says the goal is to increase behaviors that are helpful and decrease behavior, decrease 
the other types of behaviors, but the behaviors that are helpful to who? To parents of autistic people, the rest of the world. It's, it's, it teaches us that the behaviors that we do to comfort ourselves and to get through everything in life are not okay. And, and that's, you know, and, and in women, society teaches a lot of that and they don't go through ABA as much. Um, but still, I mean, society, society doing that to us and, and telling us how that we need to act and what we need to do and, and shunning us if we don't, it, it's really difficult. That's, I find that such an interesting example. And we've talked about this before on FDS, how certain concepts created with men in mind, when you apply that to women, it creates either an undesirable or a harmful effect for women. And so things like therapy for, you know, i I could have a whole episode just roasting couples therapy, right? And how the idea of like, oh, you know, you have two people and, you know, they just need to work on their communication. It's under the assumption that both people are like generally like good and are invested in the relationship, but it doesn't really take into account cases of like, say, abuse, for example, or, you know, if the man goes and cheats and, you know, you're you know, she's upset and it's like, well, what could you have done differently to make your husband not cheat on you? Right? Like so much therapy is just very sexist or just doesn't even consider the specific needs of women. Right. And so this therapy you've described to me, uh, applied behavioral, was it ABA? Uh, Applied behavioral analysis. Yeah. Um, it just sounds to me like it's just basically conditioning women to be compliant like if you do that for a girl you're just teaching her to be compliant and to not meet her own needs I mean it's it's to everybody and and it's it's really harmful to a lot of people a lot of people in autism groups speak about what they went through as a child and how they had to unlearn all of this to be able to stim and have productive lives and I think it's you know a a lot of a lot of people in the autism community are are speaking out against autism speaks and people who promote ABA and a lot of people that are neurotypical just don't, don't hear them. They don't, you know, they don't want to listen to us about what we need. They just, they want us to fit in with the rest of the world and don't really care about anything else. I can understand from the parents' perspective, maybe they're afraid their kid's going to be bullied or something if they don't fit in and that sort of thing. And now to be clear, I have a lot of sympathy for, I, I, I can understand how hard it is to watch your child suffer and, and, you know, parents definitely need support, but not, not at the risk of, of harming a child. Yeah. Like you said, it's just a different, it's just a different operating system. And I, I would love to live in a world where that was like normalized, where being an autistic person is just like, you know, it's not something like, it's something that people maybe have more understanding, more compassion about. One thing I want to mention that's important, a lot of people don't realize people with disabilities still are not equal in the U.S. We can't get married like everybody else can. We don't make the same wages as everybody else does. There are literally laws that say these things, and people are very passionate about racial bias and bias that that makes society unequal, but there are still laws against us. You don't have to pay us minimum wage. You don't have to let us get married. Um, if, you, if we get married, we can lose any benefits that we have that make up for the, the, the lack of wages and be able to feed ourselves. I mean, it's really, truly the state of disabled people in America is disgusting. And, it, you know, dis- disability is not something that it, it people become disabled. Like you can't become black one day. You can become disabled. This is something that I feel like more people should, should have compassion over, but they don't, they just tip. They feel, I feel like they don't care about disabled people. They just don't want to hear from us. They don't want to see us in wheelchairs. They don't want to, you know, I, I have a wheelchair that I use. Sometimes I have a pick line that, you know, is basically a central IV line. And people just look at me like I'm a monster sometimes. People just don't, I don't know, our country is so, it's, I mean, it's capitalist. So everyone is looked at as exploitable labor instead of as a person. And there's been, you know, depending on which political philosophy or ideology you buy into, there's been a a, a deep uh, de-emphasis of community in a lot of ways and the idea that 
community should incorporate the gifts of everybody. It's, 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 I think it's just a mentality where everybody sees people who can't contribute in the same uh, economic ways as disposable. And I agree, it's really disgusting. And it's something I hope that so I, you know, <laughs> I don't want to sound exhausted, but it's just like, it's something that I just really, really hope that we have a conversation about how are we going to structure our working life so that people feel valued and contributing and like they're part of a community and not just a widget in the corporate machine. So I, I hear you. <laughs> so I, I remember reading about, they found this uh, Neanderthal um, skeleton that had uh some like broken bones like it wouldn't have been able to walk but it lived to a very old age like 60 or 7 years old and so they were thinking like this is very strange like it this person had broken legs for uh, that healed so that means that someone must have been there to take care of them and to feed them they wouldn't have been able to like hunt by themselves and yet this person lived very long and clearly healthy life based on their bones and stuff right and a lot of um I guess it's, is it anthropologists, I guess, talk about how the idea of um, taking care of the sick or people with disabilities is what's, is what makes human society like human. It is like the defining quality of being a human being. It's what separates us from animals. This is harsh, but like if it, say, for example, a deer gives birth and they find that their baby can't like walk or whatever, the mama deer will just like leave it. We'll just abandon it. If, if um, like in most animals, if, a baby is born with any kind of deformity. Um, they just like leave it for the predators, right? But that's what makes human beings different is we take care of our of those who are maybe born different, right? Um, and include them in our community. And so, yeah, like what I'm seeing in America is... Yeah, we suck over here. I think that's been the theme of the, of the past couple of weeks. <laughs> like, our healthcare is terrible. It's, it's literally yeah. inhumane. <laughs> you know, my point, my point about it, America is inhumane. It's, it's the opposite of like, of community. It's just, it's very hard to get, th- what is it? I think the last cens- census said we had like 350 million, 360 million people. So it's very hard to get a country of the size of 50 different states to move in a collective action. And it's just, it's, um, Things have to get really bad sometimes before they get better. Sure, but shouldn't we all be for equality though? Like, is the, is the equity even like? I mean, there shouldn't we? There's certain basic things that we should all be fighting for, and I feel like the pandemic made a lot of things that we should be fighting for apparent. But it didn't. It, it, it's crazy to me that it didn't make fighting for disabled people, which the pandemic is literally causing people to become disabled. Why are we not focusing on this? I just, I, people, people are upset, but there's not a lot of people out there in front with solutions. And so. Well, I think there are, but they're not being listened to. And to be clear, autism is not always a disability. A lot of times it's not. Sometimes it can affect people's, you know, social dynamics and things, but sometimes people that are autistic thrive and are, you know, it, it's kind of it's, a lot of people have evolved to be better in a lot of things. So it's not always a disability. Yeah. In some ways I'd say, I don't know. I, I feel, I feel like some people, for some people, it's a strength. Like if they, um, like you said, it's just a different operating system. It's just- Again, when you value people based on only their economic impact or their economic who they are as an economic unit you devalue a lot of people that have things to contribute you know if if they can't do it in a way that's always directly economically measurable our society teaches them that they're not as important and i think yes the pandemic has caused us all to reevaluate what kind of society we're, li- we're living in and hopefully um hopefully we see changes in the future yeah I, if if that's okay i just wanted to add a really quick thing sure I spoke to my psychiatrist a couple of days ago, um, a new psychiatrist, first time I saw her, and uh, she was looking at my diagnosis and she was like, oh, okay, you're autistic. And then I talked about a romantic partner and she was like, oh, but you date? This misconception is actually within professionals and it's very deeply entrenched that autistic women or autistic people in general that we don't date. So the, the they really need to study us better because a lot of us date and and I think perhaps it's true that women might date more than men I have no idea but I mean 
really if if um, dating as a woman for me um it's it's a matter of how low your you accept things to go you know like where do you put the bar if you put the bar really really low you can date very easily if you put if you start moving the bar up to what you're um, going to accept or not if you only accept high value behavior for example you will have a hard time dating regardless of whether you're autistic or not but just i uh, wanted to say that the misconception is truly truly common and for me it's always a funny one because even my psychiatrist uh, had that idea dispelling misconceptions here yeah there's one a couple quick more things um so a lot of women with autism the main symptom they present with is an eating disorder and because we're picky eaters, tastes and textures are problematic for us sometimes, and that leads us to not want to eat. Um, people think that we are anorexic. Di people, you know, doctors will diagnose a woman with an eating disorder and then force her into a clinic and literally force feed her foods that make her sensory. And you know, she just—it's—it's it's really torture, really, really torture for these women. Um, I think it's, it's really important to, to, if somebody has, you know, it, it would be, you know, the women listening to this, if your children have eating problems, you know, look into autism as opposed to necessarily an eating disorder. Um, you know, because a lot, a lot of women that is women with autism, the biggest harm they have sometimes is sometimes is these inpatient, um, eating disorder clinics and, and the way they, um, the way they go about abusing these these children and even adults. So it's more so their eating disorder is more about the taste and the feel of the food and not necessarily body image. Yeah, it's not about body image at all. It's not about you know it, eating disorders are usually about control and and a lot of other things. And in autistic women, you just have to give us food that doesn't repulse us. It's not that hard, <laughs> you know. It's it's like if you cook broccoli too much, I get very grossed out. It just needs to be a little al dente, you know. And um, I, I'm very grateful that I've never been diagnosed with an eating disorder and that I had very, you know, loving family and that I, I you know, they would cook the way I wanted. And then, you know, as an adult, I cook for myself, but not everybody has that, you know, experience. And, and I really feel for these women who went through these programs and how they, you know, talk about their experiences. It's awful. You know, I have in my mind this like sense of urgency and I'm very alarmed by the amount of like grooming that I'm seeing online uh, on TikTok and on Reddit and that sort of thing. And I just get the impression that women with autism are way more likely to be um, to fall prey to this sort of predatory grooming than maybe a neurotypical woman or girl. And so, you know, I have this uh, in my mind, I'm like, we have to do something about this. Like, but you know, what can we do? Like, what, what do you have? Any, do you have any ideas? Because I have no idea. And I'm very scared. You're already doing it. FDS, the podcast, the social media, you're already doing it. Oh, thank you. I encourage women that think that they might have any of the traits of what we're talking about to go to like Aspie memes and, you know, Reddit, Reddit has a really great thing. And, and basically if you look at all of those and you're like, Oh, this is me, then look at the diagnostic criteria for women. And, you know, I mean, I think a, like, a, that's how I got, you know, my eyes were open to this and what I thought was autism, you know, I thought, when I looked at a young boy, that's what autism was. I never knew what it really was in women and, and how it presented. And I mean, I think a lot of people, if they become educated on it and learn about it, you know, they can learn why they have meltdowns, why they, you know, and then they can know what to avoid. Awesome. Well, I, I think, yeah, we're, we're over time. So let's, let's wrap up here. Ro, do you have any closing remarks? That's all I have. This was a really productive discussion. And thank you, ladies, for coming on to speak with us. Thank you very much for having me. And that's our show. Please check out our Twitter at, at femdatstrat, as well as our Patreon, patreon.com forward slash the female dating strategy, and our website, thefemaledatingstrategy.com. Thanks for listening, queens, and for all you Redditor predators out there. Die mad. <laughs> <laughs>